Sunita for uh, the good work. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, we are continuing with our um, Bible-based study lesson, uh, which is designed to improve uh, or help us improve the quality of our family life, where we are uh, looking at uh, as many aspects as uh, we can uh, in improving all aspects of our family life through the word of God. Of course, um, one may even uh, ask why why are we using uh, the Bible okay um, and 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 for me I must just put that out very clearly um, although we live in in modern times where many people uh, are of the idea that um, you know uh, there are many other things in the world that can provide answers, and I, I don't disagree with that, but I do believe emphatically and unapologetically that the word of God is the greatest teacher in the universe. That for me is not something that I am double-minded about. And I don't mind using any other resource that I can find, uh, provided that I, it is subjected to scripture first, and that scripture is the main authority. Um, so as we do uh, our family life lessons, um, you will see as we continue, there may be many other people that we will quote. There may be books that I will quote, uh, whether it's Ellen G. White, whether it's well-known uh, international family therapists, psychologists, other pastors who specialize in family ministries. We, we will do all that but we will do it in the context where it is in line with the word of God. Uh, that is what is important. It's that we build the family in line with the word of God. Um, for those maybe who have not um, engaged with me as a teacher, a preacher, and as a pastor uh, many times before, you may not be aware of it, but this is something that uh, those that I, I, I work with and uh, who have seen or have been part of my ministry will know that I do uh, uh, say this often, that experience is not the best teacher. God's word is the best teacher. This belief that experience is the best teacher, if that was the case, God would not have given us the Bible. He would have just allowed us to go through life with our experiences. Then from our experiences, we would know. We have the word of God because God himself does not believe we need to experience things in order to know they should not have been done. God has given us his word so that his word is enough to teach us and to change our direction if we are going in the wrong direction. God does not need us to suffer before we know that we should not have gone down that way. And so while the world may believe experience is the best teacher, I, I unapologetically disagree. God's word is the best teacher. You don't need to experience things before you know um, that you shouldn't have done it or that you should have done it. You know, uh, you don't need to wait for the results. God's word in many cases will tell you, if you go this way, a blessing will follow. If you go this way, a curse will follow. And so when you go down that way, uh, the other way, and the blessings start coming into your life, we can't then be surprised and say, oh my God, I'm learning from experience that if I go down that way, I'll get blessed. No, the word of God already told you that if you are going down that way, God will bless your efforts. If you go down this way and things start falling apart, we don't need to be surprised and say, my experience is teaching me that if I do this, things will, will go bad. No, the word of God had already said, 
this is not the way you go. If you go down this way, you are just a, a, a piling up coal on your head. So I'm going to make that clear again. God's word is the best teacher, not experience. So even when it comes to our family life, God's word remains the best teacher. We don't need to experience some of the disasters that other families have gone through for us to finally say, yeah, you know, um, uh, uh, this, this, this is it. No, we just need to listen to the word of God. And if God says uh, this is how a family should be run, then by going down that road, it doesn't mean every family member will, will listen, but we can at least create a spiritually sound environment which will give us even a recovery plan in the event that we, we miss uh, the direction um, along the way, okay? So we're still working with Genesis chapter one. We're still building up our principles, uh, which are the foundations of a, a, a good, stable family life. Up to so far, we've not come into... Uh, uh, issues of, uh, so are you single? Are you parenting? Are you married? We're going to get there. We're just putting up our foundation uh, for now. We're putting up our foundation for family life, right? Then from here, we are going to build uh, the family through its members. It's like we're building a house. We are currently digging and laying a foundation. From here, we are going to be putting up the walls, okay? Which will now reflect on all types uh, of, of, of family members, all right? From the single to the married, uh, the men and the women, the young, the old, uh, and, and how we then work with each other in those relationships. And really ultimately get to the roof uh, of it, okay? And see all the things that affect our family up to that level. We'll also do some uh, 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 renovations, uh, you know, even property, if you've got a, a, a property, you know, sometimes a few years down the line, you want to do some renovations. We're going to do some renovations here. And uh, we're going to talk about issues of renovations. That's conflict resolution, issues of forgiveness. That's renovations when the when, when, when the family house has to be uh, mended because something may have happened to, to damage some of its structure, okay? So let's continue with our uh, principles of family building. Now we wanna catch up uh, from verse nine. Remember yesterday, uh, we were consumed by verse uh, seven and eight. I mean, uh, yeah, well, five, six, seven, and eight. Uh, 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 at large, we were speaking about the light, the darkness, and the firmament. And then starting from verse 9, uh, now we are told that God separates the waters. Okay. Um, God separates uh, uh, the waters, uh, as we saw yesterday. But now something else in the separation happens. Remember yesterday, we looked at waters separated, waters above and waters below, right? Now we are looking at God separating even more. Now he separates the waters and calls dry land to appear. So now we've got something else. We've got dry land and we've got water. And of course, the, the water is now the oceans and the dry land is, is, is the, the, the soil, the earth on which uh, you and I have built our homes and we move through every day. And ultimately, even when we die, we are buried um, in, in, into that, uh, that earth, into that dry land. And that's the first thing I want to talk about today. The separation of the water and the dry land, okay? And that, uh, in the context of our family uh, lessons, I want us to look at that as the separation of two things. In every relationship, in every family uh, uh, relationship, we want to be able to identify two things in a family. We want to be able to identify fluid things and solid things. We want to be able to identify fixed things that anchor the relationship and fluid things that are negotiable. God separates, you know. He says, okay, water come this side, and he calls for dry land to appear. So now we've got the ocean full of water, and we've got dry land. And every, every family is, is like that. 
There are dry lands in every family and there are oceans in every family. And the ocean represents the negotiables of the family and the dry land represents the anchoring principles of the relationship within the family, okay? Now, let's start with the dry land issues of the family. The dry land issues of the family are not things that I as a pastor am going to dictate for you and say, it shall be this, 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 and that. No. But every member of the family, so it moves from individuals to family. Firstly, as individuals in the family, we must be able to communicate to our family members things that we consider to be dry land issues things that are concrete issues with me, things that our relationships are anchored on. And if we are not able to, to sustain or respect these things, it, it pretty much uh, makes it almost impossible, if well, difficult, if not impossible to say, we've got a relationship or we've got a healthy family relationship, okay? Now, as, 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 as a minister of the gospel, I'm going to state it very strongly that one of the uh, uh, land, fixed land issues of a family relationship is going to be the matter of faith and worship. In my view, God is an unnegotiable in a family. And I would want to believe that almost all of us here are here because we've got that profound agreement that God is not a negotiable because what anchors all of us here, what is the common factor between all of us here is, is, is our faith in God. For example, while I'm talking about family, but I'm anchoring it in God. So people who don't believe in God would not necessarily want to hear my family message because it may not be something they identify with because God is a non-entity in their lives. They may agree with some principles, generally speaking, but may not identify with the extent of holiness and accountability and blessing which we are bringing in. So if we are to speak about family anchoring issues, we have to talk about the fact that uh, 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 God is an unnegotiable. So remember, we are separating. Yeah? Follow the, the pattern of the story. God says, uh, let the dry land appear and let the waters be collected into uh, one side. And of course, the Bible tells us he calls the waters, the oceans or the seas and the dry land is called the earth, okay? So I need to then pose that as a challenge to each and every one of us. Do you know what are the fixed land issues of your relationships within the family? We need to know those. And as I've said, they move from, some of them are adopted by the family as a whole. Some of them you need to honor and respect them for what they mean to an individual member of the family. Okay, so there are things that will be uh, 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 ground issues, concrete issues, fixed issues of the family that we all agree on. And then there are things that we agree on insofar as they apply to me, that when this happens or when this is done, you have uh, destroyed a pillar of our relationship or you have upheld a pillar of our relationship if you have done it in a positive way, okay? So it's important for families to do that because as, as, as I've come to realize over the years, if we don't know what is our concrete and what is our fluid, now fluid meaning these are things that matter to me, but they are negotiable. Um, I am open about them. They matter, but I, I'm open about them. The 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 uh, former uh, president of the United States, um, in fact, probably one of the greatest presidents of the United States, uh, one of the founding fathers, as the Americans will put them, uh, the president uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, who wrote actually. Uh, 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 
quite key and prominent sections of the American constitution known as the Declaration of Freedom, okay? And he, his famous quotation, okay, uh, is that all men are created equal and are endowed with the rights to uh, happiness, joy, and the pursuit, the pursuit of happiness and liberty, okay? He made a statement that, uh, of course, he was using um, Victorian English um, or Elizabethan English uh, when he says, uh, in matters of fashion, swim with the current, but in matters of conscience, stand like a rock. So by fashion, he didn't mean what we call fashion today, dress up. Fashion in the, in the old English meant in peripheral issues, issues that change, you know, um, issues that are neither here nor there. So he says in matters of fashion, now nah, swim with the current. In other words, go with the flow, you know, but in matters of conscience, stand like a rock. And that is what we are talking about. Every family must know what are its fluid issues, matters of fashion. What are its fixed issues, matters of conscience, matters of a rock, matters of dry land, issues that anchor you as a family. If we as a family don't engage in dialogues that uh, educate each other about these values, we may run a danger of misaligning uh, actions and intentions towards each other. Of course, sometimes we learn when we've made the mistake. Sometimes we may have the opportunity to be educated before we even make the mistake. For example, in our families, why is it that sometimes you are deeply, deeply, deeply offended about something that someone in the family did to you. And they are looking at you smiling and they are saying, but it's not that big. It's not that big. And you are just livid. You are a volcano ready to erupt and consume everything. And the other person is just looking at you in a very weird way, like they don't understand. Why are you angry? Why, 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 why? Why is it that big? It's not from a point of disrespect. It's a point of, from a point of confusion. They don't get it. What about what I said or what I did is worthy of such a reaction? Why? You know, that's when words like you are overreacting, uh, you are blowing this out of proportion, are thrown in, and oh my goodness, you know that those statements, they just make you move from being a volcano and you become an atomic bomb. And the whole family, the whole house just becomes a Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You just go because the idea of being told you are overreacting when this is such a deeply profound issue to you can just send you overboard. It, 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 you know, really, explosion, explosion. Even Paul now is out of the window. The whole thing of Paul saying, do not finish a, 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 a day uh, in anger. Suddenly you just look at Paul and the comes, what does he know? Uh, he's never been through what I'm going through because now things have just gone, you understand? So, and, and why does that happen? It happens because issues of fluidity and issues of, 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 of uh, fixed uh, land, concrete issues, sometimes we are not aligned. We are not aligned, all right? So, as I'm saying, number one, it's very important that families, as, as much as we can, we talk about these things, not because it's an agenda. Remember, the things we are studying here, you are not now going to develop an agenda and say, Tuesday, we are going to talk about issues of uh, fluidity and no. But as we bond, as we talk to each other, 
I said this, unfortunately, quite a number of you are not there. On day one, when I started with these presentations, I said it, that family is nothing if not built by the common moments. It's in the common moments that families build bonds for life, not in the big moments. We tend to think that a family is going to bond when we go on a vacation, a holiday vacation. No, 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 no. By the time you go on vacation, if your relationship is already not close, that vacation won't help you much. It will be an awkward vacation between family members who don't know what to say to each other. Where do we build family? We build families over breakfast. We build families over supper. We build families while we are watching television together, commenting on the a TV show that we are watching, commenting on the news. That's where we are getting to know each other. That's where we are sharing ideas that invite each other into each other's thinking and each other's feelings. Do you understand? We, we, we are watching um, things, whatever it could be. I, I, I sit with my boys and they are watching something. It could be a kiddies, or sometimes they, are, they, they come when I'm watching something that is more for my age. Uh, it could be a documentary on Jesus Christ and I'm doing research, or, or, or it could be a documentary on any of the Bible books. And uh, I'm, maybe it's, you know, I'm listening to archeologists uh, breaking down certain issues. Then they'll ask me questions that will introduce me to knowing what things confuse them about Jesus. See, what, when we are doing it, the, the kiddies' lessons, I would not have known. But now as they were sitting there watching me watch that program as I'm listening, then a professor from somewhere makes a statement about Jesus Christ. And suddenly one of my boys will say, so did, did Jesus do this and this and that? And then I'll say, yes. And then I'll say, why? Doesn't, isn't, that, or isn't that awkward? Oh, so now I get to know. So they have such questions in their minds about Jesus. It could be questions that I would have thought that they are too young to have. But over a moment of watching television together, I've come to know. So families are that, please, you have to understand that. Families are not built on great days, anniversaries, birthdays, graduation ceremonies, vacations. Listen, when you failed to build the family in between the little moments, on those big days, they are just physically showing up. But the truth is there's no relationship. There's no bond. There's no intimacy within the family. So I want to strongly caution us, don't target big days as days when you will show the family that you are there and that you love them and that they matter, which is the mistake most of us make, particularly parents. We spend so much time working, thinking that from the money we make, we will make up for that time with a great holiday, a great birthday. That's when you'll prove how a, such a good mother you are or a good father you are. No, by then you are late. By then you are late. By then you are buying gifts. You are funding a holiday with people who don't know you and you don't know them. All right? So families are not built on great days. Families are built in the in-between. It's cooking together. It's cleaning together. It's eating together. It's watching television together, praying together. Now, it's there that we are going to have the conversations that introduce the family to its values and the family members to your individual position. I don't know if you understand that. So it's during these discussions that I'm able to introduce my family to, 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 um, land issues. Remember, we are talking about God separating the oceans and the dry land. So during the breakfast, during the dinner, during the, 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 the watching of the television, something may happen. We could be uh, 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 watching. There was the, There's a movie, for example, that 
um, came out, I think it was two years ago, and it really rocked the debates between men and women. This movie called Acrimony, okay? Uh, many of you may have watched it. If you haven't watched it, I would recommend that you find it and, and, and you watch it, uh, Acrimony. I wonder if it's on Netflix. I, I've never checked, but you know, and and it, it it's in watching movies like that that you are sitting with your wife, you are discussing this movie about what is happening. What do you think? Is this guy correct? Is this guy wrong? Is this wife correct? Is this wife wrong? Why are you sympathizing with the woman? Why are you sympathizing with the man? Where are you relating with them? But then it moves from the movie to us. Okay, if this happened, I don't think I would survive it. If this happened, yes, I would survive it. Do I think I've got the strength to forgive you on such an issue? Yes, I think I do. What about this one? No, maybe I'll have to cross that bridge when I get there. Those are the conversations that build knowledge about issues of concrete and fluidity. Okay, that's how we get to introduce each other. So I'm saying, for example, at a family level, worship is a good example where we can say worshiping God in this family is a land issue. It's a concrete issue. We, we are not going to deviate from it. It stands as it is. We worship God in this family. And it's not a fluidity issue. It's not a negotiable issue. It's not a waves issue. We are not going to ride the wave whether you believe or not. As a family, this anchors us and it's not negotiable, okay? So other families can build other things. People can build on things like, for example, look, uh, fidelity, infidelity is a concrete issue in this family, okay? And especially things like that because sometimes they carry past traumas. So, so someone may need to make it clear and please let's not preempt issues of forgiveness because sometimes we do that as a way of opening the door of taking advantage of our spouses. Let's not do that. When someone says to you, I don't have the heart to forgive infidelity. Don't use that as an opportunity to criticize whether they are good Christians who are able to forgive or not. No, 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 no. This is not about you trying to poke holes in someone's position so that you may create room for your future infidelities. No, listen to them. They are telling you a concrete issue. I can't forgive infidelity. That person has not drawn a line in the sand. It's not a fluid issue, all right? They have literally chiseled the rock so that anyone can see, this is where I stand on this issue. This is where I stand. It's not a fluid issue to me, it's a concrete issue. So should this happen? In other words, if I do forgive you, you will be surprised by me. But as a matter of principle, this is a matter that I would not be able to survive. Now I'm saying those things are important, particularly because sometimes people have traumas where they were born in, in, in marriages where there was a divorce because of infidelity and they went through so much pain of not having both parents in the house. So they know what they are talking about. They don't want to relive it. They don't want to manage it. They don't want to uh, 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 be helped to pray over it. It is a barrier that they have agreed in their relationship with God to say, Lord, don't test me with this one. Don't, don't even attempt to give me strength for it. I don't want to deal with this. I grew up under it. I suffered under it. It killed us as a family. I recovered from it. I was able to trust and love again. I'm not going to manage it again. So it's very important in the family that we do that. Listen to the concrete issues that your family members are placing before you. And it doesn't have to be concrete for you as well, for you to respect it. No, that is what love calls upon us to do. Love challenges us to put ourselves in the position 
of, of those that we love and respect the position that they have. So something may be very light to me. I may listen to this and think, but this is a very light issue. I, I, I don't see why I wouldn't forgive you if you, you cheated on me. Then, but that's me. That's the lightness of the strength that God has given me. He has given me enough strength to see this thing in a light way. The other person, on the other hand, may not. And it's important to then say, I hear you. I respect what this means to you. I respect the burden it comes with. And because I know that to you, this is a concrete matter. I then will do everything in my power not to put you in the valley of temptation where you will be forced to, to now deal with this not happening or this happening. Okay, so now I become a responsible family member in the sense that I now know that I don't want to put you in a valley of temptation. I don't want to tempt your faith. I don't want to tempt your love by doing the very thing which you've told me. That's a very important thing that I, I need us to understand today. It's very important to protect the love with which you are loved by not subjecting it to temptation. See, if someone loves you, don't tempt their love. Don't subject their love for you into temptation. If you really respect that someone loves you, then your reaction must be to protect that love and keep it intact. Don't, don't make it suffer okay so don't don't bring suffering upon it when you know very well that you've been told that this love does not want to go through such a temptation it's really that uh, um simple so by learning issues of 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 uh, uh, land and ocean yeah what is fixed what is fluid we are able to then say to each other, okay, I understand how much this matters to you and I respect it, okay? Equally, you, you, you learn the other person, okay, so this is a light thing to you. Oh, okay. So you, when you do this, you are really just joking. You are not meaning anything uh, significant about it. Oh, okay. Now, now I too maybe can start le learning to let my gut down and say, you know what? Let me not take myself too seriously on this issue. Let me give as well, you know, a point of compromise. Let me give. Um, my, my, my family member is doing this from a good heart. They are not aiming to hurt anyone. They are not aiming to disrespect anyone. It's light. And in its lightness, I possibly also would enjoy it if I just took a, st a step back, breathed a bit, and then try to embrace it, I might find myself enjoying it, okay? So there are fluid issues where we are not going to anchor our family, we are not going to anchor its survival and its life on those issues. But I'm saying there are some that as, as, as a community of believers we can agree on. We can agree on issues of faith, for example. However, the majority of these things are going to require a conversation between us as family members, not over one night, but over time, where we gradually introduce each other to the things that matter. And some of them then we build together, especially the family ones, rather than me saying, it shall be like this. We can then build it together and say, guys, this thing, do we want to make it a pillar of this family? Do we want to make it part of the things that define this family? Do we want to make it part of those things that anchor us and so that all of us work towards protecting it? Okay? And, and it, it can be a very beautiful thing. You know, I've seen families, for example, that have carried certain traditions for years, generations after generation, because they've discovered that it works and it's something that the family has kept together and have, have decided this is one of our pillars. And it really has over the years yielded the results of a better, stronger, happier family. So 
as a family, we may discuss some of these things to say what is in our identity as a family that is concrete and we do not want to negotiate. And what is within our identity as a family that we say, look, guys, we can always negotiate this one. It's, it's a fluid issue. We can be in it or not in it. It doesn't challenge who we are as a family. So now we I, I would challenge that we also do that as a family act like God in your relationship, start identifying what is the ocean of the family? What is fluid? What is the dry land of the family? What is concrete? What is hard? What is it that we need in order to be able to walk on so that the family is on a solid ground? Because if, if we are not on it, then we are going to sink. What are we willing to swim over? No, it's not that uh, 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 big of a deal, all right? Those things are very important, okay? And also, let me just add this there. When I say something is not a big of a deal, I'm not meaning it in the sense that, ah, you can do it, I don't mind. But I mean also those things which are a big deal, but you are saying, I think I'm able to overcome this. Okay? So when we call things fluid, we are not, suggesting that th these are the things that don't matter. Sometimes there are things that matter. However, you sense that uh, I'm, I'm able to navigate this one. And so it could be uh, 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 on, 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 on such footings as well, all right? And as I said, some things are just purely down to individuals. Let me give you an example. You know, my wife takes birthdays very seriously. My, to my wife, birthdays are an extremely concrete thing. They are not something that as a family we, we, we play around with because it really deeply, deeply matters to her that birthdays are honored and celebrated and that they are not forgotten, okay? It's something that we, we've had to work ourselves into because for me, no. You know, I could go on for decades without anyone ever saying happy birthday. I'm really neither here nor there about whether someone has said happy birthday or they remembered or they got me a gift. It's, it's really to a point that when I'm asked what do I want for my birthday, it's the most difficult question in my life because to me, the day before I was born and the day after are just the same. We, we could really go on as cook the same meal we cooked yesterday and psh, just cruise along. So in, in that respect, we've then had to uh, 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 acclimatize to the fact that for our family, birthdays have to be an anchoring issue. They have to be a deeply important issue because uh, that's how much they mean to her. And she has instilled it in all of us that that is how much birthdays should mean. So it's something that I had to give away. Now I also take birthdays very, very seriously and they are planning and everything I now take very, very seriously because that is what one of the crucial members of our family uh, uh, believes it, it, it should be. Very important to understand those things. Because if they are not understood, we are going to get into friction, serious friction, okay? But sometimes even when we get into friction, the one who's offended, try and understand, did you educate everyone? Did they know what this means to you? Th those things are very important. Have they had time to adjust and understand? Of course, all that will then be within the merits of the challenge that might be there um, within the family. And I hope we're still uh, together and we're still following. The reason I'm spending so much time explaining one point is because I'm trying as best as I can not to leave anyone with a misconception or misunderstanding of what I am saying. So I apologize for those who may think we got it very early, we got it within the first two lines. Um, you may have gotten it, but I just have to try and make sure that I bring everyone on board in everything that I explain. Okay, so then what follows after that, that I'd like us to also um, pay attention to, that is important. He then calls on for uh, now vegetation to come from the dry, uh, uh, the dry land. He calls for the trees and they are every kind of living thing. 
And that's something that's important that I'd like to pick up, okay? And you're going to see it on both atmosphere situations uh, because I'm going to be working on them. Maybe let me connect it with the, with the other one. He also then uh, says, and this is verse 20, he calls upon every living creature. He puts living creatures into the oceans, all right? So from the dry land, he calls for the trees, for the vegetation to come. From the sea, he puts in, okay? He puts in living creatures. The, whatever that needs to be in the sea, he puts it in there. So here's then the next lesson that I want us to look into. God calls vegetation to, to come from the dry land, okay? Two things I want to talk about that emerge from there. One, in each and every family, we have to be intentional about growth. We have to grow. Things have to grow in a family. We have to grow and we have to be intentional about it. We have to call for growth in a family. And I mean growth in every aspect. We have to be intentional about spiritual growth. We have to be. That means children have to be taught. Prayer times, uh, biblical discussions have to be had where we discuss the scriptures, we discuss the word of God. We have to grow. There has to be vegetation that grows. Why? If we don't grow, remember I likened I likened the dry land to principles, to fixed things, then that's what happens. We become a family that has principles, principles but dry ones. We are principled, but we are dry. In other words, from our concrete principles, we are not growing anything that is beautiful. We are just dry, we are rigid, we are principled, but we are not happy. We are not growing, we are not diversifying, we are not being colorful, there are no flowers that are coming up, there is no diversity, because we are dry. Growth is necessary. So from the principles that we have agreed on as a family, we must use those principles as a stepping ladder for growth. So there must be an intention to grow spiritually. Okay? Pr praying with your children, very important. Praying as a family, very important, okay? We, there must be an intention to grow uh, in terms of careers, for example. And that may take different parts. That they may mean we have to study. And I think families should do that. We should need to talk about it. Are we studying? Why are we not studying? Are we satisfied with the, the qualifications we have? Yes, okay. So if studying is not the route we are taking towards our growth as a family, what route are we taking? That, that's an important discussion. There has to be growth in the family. There has to be growth, okay? And, and, and yes, you may not be interested on one part of it, but there has to be growth. For example, there are families where people are just satisfied with what they've got. You know, we are satisfied with our qualifications. We are satisfied with our careers. We are satisfied with our salaries. We are satisfied with the house we can afford. We are satisfied with the car we are driving. We really don't want anything more than that. God be praised, all as it is, we, we are okay. That's fine. That does not mean there is no growth. We have to have growth in other ways as well. We have to look at growth, as I said, uh, it, maybe spiritually, we have to look at growth, maybe uh, in terms of future planning and finances. But it is important to note that from the dry land, God called things to grow. God didn't just say, let there be dry land. And then after that, he was like, all right, we've got our dry land. We are done. No. Did he have dry land? Yes. Was it concrete? Yes. Was it stable? Yes. But then then it let growth. Every principle and fixed foundation a family builds is not just so that we look at it and say, oh, wow, we are a principled family. So what? From your principles, something must grow. Huh? We do it. 
We develop principles, why? So that we may raise our children. What is happening? Something is growing on the basis of the principle. From the principles we have, children are sprouting and they are growing because that's what solid foundations are for. They are for growth. Things must grow. The career must grow. The family must grow. And families that grow by default, it's not recommendable. Families must grow intentionally. Where are you going? Because listen to me, if you grow by default, then like vegetation, you might as well grow weed as well. Anything just grows. But when we are intentional, we can prune. Yeah? Now we know what we want and we know what we don't want in the family growth. Because if we just say, oh, let's just grow, we'll see. Then what happens is anything may rise up in the family and we may find ourselves overwhelmed by the shrubs of life because we were not intentional about where we are going and what we want to see. No, a family needs to be very, very, very clear about its growth path. Why? That will guide even our budgeting. Now we are not wasting, because remember your finances can become like water in a garden. If we don't know where we are going, then our money is watering everything. Yeah? We're just spreading everywhere. And we are spending very valuable money watering things that are not even part of the future of this family. So many of our families were actually wasting money because we are watering growth that is not needed for the future of the family. We are just throwing money everywhere. You know, we, we're buying cars because we can buy cars. We are doing things because we can do things. But when, when we know where we want our families to grow, we can deal with, we can remove money from there and say, we don't need money there. We are financing something that is not part of our family plan. Let's remove our money from there. It's watering weed. Let's put it there. That is where our family wants to grow our, fa our finances need to water that area. Our prayers need to water that area. Our Bible study needs to water that area, okay? Our efforts, our studying, our intellectual outlook needs to water that area because we are being intentional about growing as a family. Families that don't have intentional growth also end up being frustrated by growth. And what do I mean? When the family is not intentional about growing, what then happens sometimes is that one person becomes intentional about their growth, whether spiritual, academic, intellectual, financial, professional. And then what happens is that as this person grows, a gap develops between this person and the other members of the family. You know what happens when a rocket leaves planet Earth? When a rocket leaves planet Earth, usually there will be three boosters around it, and then there is going to be that actual uh, a spaceship. And as it gradually rises and it leaves Earth's atmosphere, the booster engines keep falling away. And then before long, the spaceship is floating in space on its way to its mission. That is what is happening with many families and people are not even realizing. One member of the family is shooting for the stars. The others are just there for the journey accompanying. But as the other one is shooting for the stars, it then becomes clear that we are not destined to the same height. Now problems emerge. There is difficulty in relating. There is difficulty in working together because we are not intentionally growing, all of us. And then what happens? Then the rocket begins to shed off some boosters. People have divorced over intentional growth. Do not take lightly what I'm saying. People have divorced over intentional growth while others thought it was just unnecessary and a waste of time, others invested. 
And before long, insecurities rise. Very important. Because as people grow, what happens? They also become part of communities that share their pursuits. Now, you may find that the growing person is not doing anything unhealthy. But the one not growing suddenly develops insecurities. Who are you talking to? What are you talking about? If it's a wife, you may be a man growing in your profession. You are meeting women that are growing in your profession. You are working with these women in teams. You are talking all the time. Suddenly, now you've got this person. Who are you talking to? Who are these women you are talking to? Where are they from? So now you find yourself having to always defend every woman that shows up in your emails. What does that do? It begins to get taxing as well because you are beginning to feel like you constantly have to defend and explain your success. And then there it begins. The booster's shadow and the relationship is torn. Intentional growth should never be undermined. That doesn't mean we are all going to grow uh, in the same space. Please listen to me very carefully. You could be the wife that likes academics. Grow. Not all of us want a PhD. But even if I'm not pursuing academics, I should be pursuing growth in my own space as well in such a way that I too am feeling very fulfilled and satisfied about the space where I am growing. In this way, we respect each other and we don't look down on each other. Remember, and I have to warn, particularly those members of the family who grow academically and who grow professionally, please don't look down on other members who are growing differently. Growing academically and growing professionally is not the ultimate definition of growth. It's one of other, okay? Just one of many. There's a tendency for those who are doing their master's degrees and their PhDs and their second degrees to then think, I am of greater value in the family than those who are not studying. No, 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 no. All these are equal. The issue it has to be the intensity, the intentionality that is devoted where we are growing, okay? So it's important that within the family, we are all intentional about our growth and that every family member is celebrated as their growth is yielding results. There are people who are not doing school, but who are running businesses that are doing very well. That is highly recommendable growth. And so in the family, we have to be asking each other, where are you looking to grow? Some growth we can share as a whole family, like I'm saying, spiritually. We can all just make a target that we want to have a better relationship with God, or we want to know the Bible better as a family. So this is growth we can intentionally tackle as a family. And then there's growth that we need to tackle as individuals. And when I speak of growth also, you must remember it Emotional growth is also very important. So it must not just be limited to uh, things that have empirical evidence like school and money, but also growing spiritually and emotionally is very important. Growing in health is very important, okay? We can decide as a family, guys, let's make this the year of gymming and exercising and eating healthy and living healthy. This is our growth point as a family this year. We are going to lose weight. We are going to be within the right weight. We are going to be within the right cholesterol fat ratios in our bodies. We just want to target this as our growth. But growth is intentional. God didn't just look at the dry land and hoped that something would happen. He commanded. Do you notice that everything that is happening in the story of creation is commanded? It's not happening on its own. God is calling it to be because intention is very important in the family success. You have to intend to be in a family. You have to intend to love your family members. You have to intend to contribute positively in your family. When there is no intention, you are not part of the family. 
you have to be intentional about being in the family that you are in. Otherwise, you are not part of that family. Now, let's look at the sea. Then God says, let the sea team with all the type of life that one could think of. And, you know, he put it in there, all of it. Whatever was in his mind, he put it in there. And there it was. And that's the other point that I want to talk to. Every family has to treat itself as an ocean. And here's the key issue there. Make deposits into your ocean. The ocean is like a bowl and God filled it. Okay? So when we go fishing, what are we doing? We are pulling out of the bowl that God filled. At the beginning, this big basin called the ocean, God filled it with life. And having filled it with life, we are able to be sustained by it. We go there, we fish, we eat. We fish, we eat. People cannot draw from the family what has not been deposited. There has to be an intention to fill the ocean of the family with things that will feed the family. We expect love from the family. We expect support from the family. We expect uh, 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 many things from the family. The things we expect from the family have to be deposited into the family. No one can withdraw or fish out of a family whose oceans have never been commanded to have life. How are you drawing from what no one is putting into? That lake of the family is bound to be dry very soon because no one is depositing. And so the one thing that I want to challenge us also to do is when we, and, and I usually prefer to use it as sunrise and sunset. It sort of works for me in my mind, okay? And what do I mean by that? I see every morning as an opportunity to deposit into the family. And every evening as an opportunity to withdraw. In my mind, it makes sense because in the morning, I am fresh, I have no needs. So I'm going to put in, put in the love, put in the working together, put in the cooperation in many different ways. And many of them I will, we will discuss as we continue with this series. Now, as the day continues, there may be things that hurt us at work and elsewhere. Coming together as a family in the evening, we get to withdraw from that love as we heal from what the day has done to us. But you see, if we've not been depositing throughout the day, what are we withdrawing from at sunset? What I'm sharing with you is a biblical principle. God himself does it. Jeremiah says it. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. So every morning, God makes a deposit of mercy so that as the day goes bad in sinning, we have a deposit of mercy to withdraw from because God made deposits in the morning. So when the sun sets, I can go to God on my knees and say, I have come to confess my sins. What is my basis for confession? God made deposits for mercy in the morning. So I have mercy to withdraw from. I have mercy to go into the bowl and take from because God made a deposit in the morning. By the end of the evening, by the time I go to bed, I've used all the mercy provision for today. I have asked for forgiveness. I have confessed. So what does that mean? As I'm sleeping at night, God is preparing a new bowl of mercy for tomorrow. So that tomorrow morning, he will put in another deposit. 
And the family is the same. The family is an ocean in which we need to deposit every species that we need for the sustaining of the family. And unfortunately, many times we are withdrawing from families that we are not depositing into. And what that results in are families that are tired and exhausted and drained because no one is putting in. No one is putting in. And we need to reverse that, all of us. It's, it's not a responsibility of mom only or dad only. No, it's the responsibility of every family member. So here's something that I'd like to teach all of us. It's something that I do every morning. I hope it works for you. It certainly works for me. The, 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 most, the most important thing for me every day when, when the day begins, the question that rules my mind as the day begins is how shall I serve my family today? That's my first line. How shall I serve my family today? Because if I answer that, I answer it through my actions during the day. So whatever I am doing, it's part of my service. Whether I'm cleaning, whether I'm cooking, whether I'm teaching, whether I'm supporting, whether I'm talking, whether I'm hugging, whether I'm driving someone somewhere, whether it's help with their homework, it doesn't matter what it is. I am answering the question, how am I going to serve my family today? In other words, what am I going to be dropping into the bowl of this Mazibugo family? What am I going to be pouring in so that in the evening I could have made mistakes, but I have deposited enough that when I go to the family and I ask for forgiveness, if I've done something that offends them, they have a, an ocean, a lake of forgiveness or positive contributions from which they can withdraw forgiveness and give it to me as a gift. We all have to ask that. How shall I serve my family today? And that is my, your contribution into the ocean of the well-being of the family. See, when you wake up in the morning, the first thing on your mind should not be, they are going to start with me. They are going to upset me. That's a self-serving attitude. You are more interested in what people should be doing towards you no, let's all ask, what will I do today? The day is starting. Alarm goes off 4 a.m., 5 a.m., whichever time you guys start to wake up as a family. As you wake up, as you say your prayers in, and, and you thank God for the good night's rest and you, you also thank God that you are about to start your day, then also ask God, Lord, as the morning starts, gives me strength to make deposits into my family account. Give me strength. Let me put some species of fish into the family ocean so that when the family is hungry, it can go there and it can fish. And I will know that I made a deposit. Big things big complicated things like abusing each other. Do you know where they begin? An abusive husband, an abusive wife, the one who beats, the one who, who, who swears. Do you know where it begins? It begins with the fact that when they wake up in the morning, they do not ask how shall they make their family better. They ask, how will the family serve me today? That is the attitude of narcissists. That is the attitude of abusers. How will everyone serve me today? So that if they don't do it, I beat them. If they don't do it, I swear them. If they don't do it, I deny them access to my money. If they don't do it, I go and have my extramarital affair because I'm angry. They are not making me happy the way I want to be happy. So now I'm going to go off and look for somebody who is going to do it my way. Ultimately, these things grow out of being selfish. That is why Jesus says the number one reason for divorce is that you have hardened your hearts. I recently made a presentation for 
a Zimbabwean CAM meeting just on this issue of divorce. And I was saying, when we read verses on divorce, we've missed what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say adultery causes divorce. No, read properly. He said, the hardening of your hearts is the reason why divorce became a reality. Start where things start. No one in this world would divorce if we didn't harden our hearts. Nobody. Because as soon as your spouse says to you, please don't do this, it hurts me. You stop it. You simply stop it. And as soon as you stop it, divorce is averted. So why do we divorce? Someone hardens their heart. Someone decides, I will do what I want to do even if it hurts you. Hardening of the heart is the reason why families fall apart. Because hardening of the heart is selfishness. It's all about what I will gain. How are they going to serve me? And when they don't serve you, you become abusive, you become angry, you become manipulative. But if we wake up in the morning and say, Lord, what a joy, what a privilege, what an honor that I'm, I have been given another day to be a member of this family. How can I serve them? How can I make life easier for them? How can I make sure that today, among the many challenges they are going to face, my presence in their lives will have made the load just a bit that easier to carry. Now, if imagine if we all asked that in the morning, then by default, what it means, if we've, we've all asked that on each other's behalf, which means we've all made ourselves available to God to carry each other through as members of the family, which means the ocean is full, full of love, full of forgiveness, full of kindness. It's full of food. We can all go in, we can fish and pull out what we want because the depositors are putting in. Families cannot survive if their members do not make intentional deposits. Soon the ocean runs dry, the fish are gone, there's nothing to eat. Yes, there is still a family, but it's a very dry family because no one is able to withdraw everything, anything from it. Everything has been withdrawn, but everyone is too self-centered to make a deposit. So it, we've withdrawn everything, but now we are all sitting in our corners waiting for someone to deposit so that we withdraw some more. That's not how it works. You've got to make your own contribution into the ocean. Otherwise, the family is going to be very dry and lifeless. And we will have nothing that we can draw from. No love, no mercy, no forgiveness, no joy, no intimacy, nothing. Because we were all just taking, but we are not putting anything in it. So that's where we're going to go uh, stop for today. Oh, I've exceeded by 10 minutes. My, my, my apologies there. Um, these are things that we would then need to reflect on today. So may God bless you and may God keep you. And I trust that once again, what we've discussed today um, is enlightening and that it will help us to create a better environment in which we are doing family and we are doing family life um, as well. May God bless you with your families. May he keep you. And today I part with that as the key point. May God give you and your family new mercies every morning. As we go to our rest tonight, some will be working, some will be going to sleep. But one thing I pray for, for all of us, when we tomorrow morning knock off work, when we tomorrow morning wake up, may we enjoy all the love and mercy that God will have deposited for us for a new day. And from there, I pray that you may be inspired to prepare also an ocean of love, mercy, kindness, and service for your family as well. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your leadership and your teaching and your presence with us this evening. I pray, Heavenly Father, that your word may be cemented in our hearts through the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
For your Bible teaches us that he is the only one who is able to bring to remembrance everything that we've been taught. He is also the only one with the power, the power to turn the word into life. And so I pray that his power may be manifest as this word becomes life in our families. We do not only pray, you Heavenly Father, and ask that you forgive us our sins, which we confess unreservedly. We pray also that you teach us to forgive others. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you may teach us to also be merciful to others as you've been merciful to us. We pray all this through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.